Hi, church. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to the third Sunday in Advent. Um, from the Latin Adventus, which means a coming, the coming. Advent is the four weeks on the Christian calendar that leads up to Christmas where the church, where God's people set aside those four weeks as a unique and special time to ponder and consider and celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ in flesh, incarnated God. We take these four weeks to really set aside time to read and pray and consider and keep in our minds for four weeks this breathtaking, staggering reality that God came in the form of man, that he did not consider equality with God anything to be grasped or held on to, but made himself nothing and was found in human likeness and became a servant, became a slave and obedient even to the point of death, even a death on the cross. So I hope you're taking this time during the Advent season to do just that, to give serious thought in much prayer and meditation and memorization of, of parts of this story and parts of the Word of God revolving around it. Please don't let the Advent season go without taking time to do that. We're taking time here to answer the question in these four Sundays, why? Why did Jesus come? And Travis gave us the first answer from scriptures a couple of weeks ago from 1 Timothy chapter 1 where the Apostle Paul explicitly states that Jesus came to save sinners. Where Jesus came to save sinners, as Paul goes on to say, of whom I am the foremost, of whom I am chief. I've always said that's the one text of scripture I disagree with. Paul didn't know me when he wrote that. But Jesus came. That's just as clear. These answers are so explicit and clear in the Bible. He came. Why? To save sinners. And then last week, Jonathan took us to Mark chapter 10, where again, Explicitly, it says, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. We were in bondage, we were enslaved, and we were held captive to sin and all of its penalty and consequences. And Jesus came and paid the ransom price as only he could pay. And that is the ransom price of his blood to buy us, to redeem us out of that enslavement to sin. Why did he come? To pay the ransom price that was on my head for sin and release me from its power and its penalty. And I showed up today to tell you that he came to destroy the works of the devil. It came from our text this morning that I read to you. If you're not there, go to 1 John chapter 3. And specifically in verse number 8, again, I want to use the word again, it is explicit. I love how Jesus says several times, and so do the apostolic writers, Jesus would say, I came for, I came for this reason, here's why I'm here. And the apostolic writers do the same thing. He came because of this. He came for this reason. And John the Apostle in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Now, here we go. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I want us to spend a good chunk of our time on that word, appeared, that word appeared deserves a whole sermon. That word appeared is just pregnant and packed with meaning. The word appeared comes from a Greek word that means something, pardon me, that was hidden that has now been manifested or revealed. Something that was not known is now known. Uh, something that was incomprehensible was now comprehensible. 
Uh, something that was unreachable and unattainable has, if you will, materialized itself. That's what the word appeared mean. And so when John writes that the Son of Man appeared, what he's saying is what we had never seen before, what we had never understood, what we had never been able to reach, all of a sudden was reachable and understandable and was um, something that we could see. Look at verse number 8. He, the Son of Man, appeared. I like how Eugene Peterson translates that word in his work, The Message. He says that the Son of Man entered the scene. In other words, he showed up. And he revealed himself. Now, that word appeared all of a sudden pushes us a little deeper under the question that we're asking. Why did he come? And when you read the word appeared, it pushes you a little deeper and under that to ask yet another question that I think every single human being eventually at some point has to answer. And really how you answer will mean the eternal well-being or demise of your soul. And the question is this, do you even believe that he appeared? Was this man that the Bible talks about named Jesus from the city of Nazareth, was he a real person, a historical figure who really did walk this earth or is the whole thing a myth? Is the whole thing, as you hear so often, just made up by people? Now, never mind what Jesus said about himself. Never mind his works. Never mind his teaching. We're pushing all that aside for a moment. And we're just asking, was he real? Did he really show up? Did he really enter the scene? Did he really walk this earth? Was he a real person? Like we would say, Nero was real, even though we never seen him. Abraham Lincoln was real, even though we never saw him. Is he real? And I'll dive right in to that answer and say to you this. Anyone who is intellectually honest, has intellectual integrity, and has done even a cursory reading about first century Palestine will know that it is unarguable and undeniable that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, really was a real person who really did live, really did walk the earth for 33 years in Palestine during antiquity. It's just unarguable. So I thought I'd give you a really quick little survey of what historians say. And listen, I'm talking about unbelieving historians who have no skin in this game, no horse in this race to try to prove that Jesus existed, but he did. For example, Lawrence Mytuck, who is a professor of library science at Purdue University, who has done much research into this, writes this, even in extra-biblical evidence of Jesus. In other words, outside of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the four greatest and most reliable records that we have to the historicity of Jesus Christ in his life. And so what this professor is saying is, taking all that aside and looking at extra-biblical references and evidence, there was no debate about the issue in ancient times about the existence of Jesus. Jewish rabbis who didn't like Jesus or his followers accused him of being a magician and leading people astray, but they never said he didn't exist. Bart Ehrman is a professor of religion at University of North Carolina, and he makes the statement that I think is readily acceptable, and that is this man from the first century, Flavius uh, Josephus was the most prolific writer about the history of Palestine and the Middle East in those days, voluminous writer, and many, many people go to him to learn about the history of that time, and Ehrman says that he is the single best source of historical information about first century Palestine, and Josephus writes twice about Jesus. Once, he's writing about the unlawful execution of a man named James, 
And Josephus goes on to say, this James who was the brother of a man named Jesus who they called the Messiah. And then in the second record, he writes a little bit more about his acts and his works and his teaching, and he makes the statement that this Jesus undeniably did surprising deeds. The first century Roman governor, Pliny the Younger, he wrote a letter to Emperor Trojan, and he was saying to him that these Christians often gather and they sing hymns to Christ as if he were a god. Or the first century Roman senator and historian Tacitus who wrote, the emperor Nero falsely blamed the persons commonly called Christians who were hated for all of their enormities. Jesus Christ was their founder, and he was put to death by Pontius Pilate, the procurator of Judea during the reign of Tiberius. And on and on it goes from historical writers even outside of the family of God who don't even believe that Jesus was uh, the Messiah, uh, the Son of God. And putting all that aside, we have to answer the question, did he exist? That's where it starts. Did he live? Was he real? And if you acknowledge, again, with intellectual uh, integrity and reading these historical sources, if you land at the fact he did exist... Obviously, he existed. Any more than I just said the Roman uh, governor, Pliny the Younger. You would read that in a history book and not even question that. You'd read that and say, well, there was a guy with a really weird name, Pliny, and he was the younger of something or another, I guess. And so, too, they wrote about Jesus. He really was real. And John wanted you to know that, too. Look back at 1 John chapter 1, so you should be in 1 John 3. Just turn the page back, and I want you to see how he started this letter. And listen, more than understanding what I'm about to read here, feel his words. Are you with me? Give me an uh-huh. Yeah. Feel these, these, the emotion of these words, the pathos of these words is unmistakable. So look at verse number 1, 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. Concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Do you feel that? Here's what John, he starts the letter by saying this, and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extrapolate out and say, I want to tell you in this letter about Jesus, listen, and he says this, who I have seen with my own eyes. I've heard him. I've seen, I could pick him out of a crowd. I know what he looks like. I'm telling you, he's real. I heard he could be talking over here, and I would hear him and say, that's Jesus. I knew what his voice sounds like. And then John goes on and says, and I touched him. I've held his hand. I've hugged him. I put my hand on his back. I know what he feels like. I've seen him. I've heard him. I've touched him. See, John, at the very beginning of the letter, is basically saying this, I really want you to believe with me that he really was a real person. But he takes it deeper then, doesn't he? Because he gives these little descriptive phrases about Jesus as he's trying to communicate the reality of the man, Jesus. He gives these descriptive phrases when he says things like, look at verse number one. That which was from the beginning, oh boy. You know the Jews who read that knew exactly what he was talking about, and probably many of you do too. It harkens back to Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. And so here in 1 John 1, 1, he says, that which was from the beginning, Genesis 1, 1. Now all of a sudden, listen, all of a sudden with that very first statement, what John is communicating is this man who was really real was no mere man. This dude's been around from the beginning. And John is saying, when I say beginning, I mean capital B, beginning which we have seen and heard with our eyes, 
which we looked upon and we've touched with our hands concerning, watch, the word of life. Who else could have that said about them? The life was made manifest, manifest excuse me, and we've seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you, watch, the eternal life, which was with the Father, and it was made manifest to us. All of this is packed in that word, appeared. What John just said was, I've seen him, I've touched him, I've heard him. He's from the very beginning, a creation. He has been with the Father since the beginning. And then listen, he ends with saying this, that one was made manifest before me and appeared, and I know what he looks like. I know his voice. I've touched him. You see, <coughs> pardon me, all of that comes from this word appeared. And I am really sorry in so many respects that we're so familiar with this story. I'm not sorry. Amen, we know it. Amen, we can recite it. We know where to go in the Bible to read it and share it. Amen, amen, amen. But I am really sorry that we are so familiar with it and so used to it that we really can read it and close our Bible and yawn and think about what we have to do that day. It, it's almost at times mundane to us it's old hat. It becomes rote. We say, God Almighty incarnated himself in flesh. Been hearing that since I was five years old. And that was the most staggering event in the history of the world. I would argue that the incarnation of God, listen, what happened that night in Bethlehem was the most breathtaking event in the history of the human race. Nothing comes near it. It was, listen close now, it was the thinnest place, the thinnest experience that has ever been or will ever be. You know what I mean by thin? Not a word I use often. <laughs> when I say thinnest place, thinnest experience, it comes from an ancient Celtic Christian tradition. And I love it. And when I'm done, I hope you love it and you'll go look into it some. Just Google Celtic Christian thin place. Here's what the Celts said about a thin place. A thin place to the Celts was any place or experience where all of a sudden that distance between heaven and hell became thin. And beyond a reasonable doubt, you just knew the experience of being in the presence of God. That that distance between the holy and the profane from heaven to earth from the righteous to the unrighteous, that distance between us and the heavens and God came together in a thin place. Those experiences where you just know that you know that you know you are in the living, sacred, holy presence of Almighty God. Like Jacob, after he wrestled all night with God, when he woke up, what did he say? Surely God is in this place. What he was saying is, oh, this is a very thin place. You ever had an experience like that? I've had several. And I love every one of them. Thought I'd share a few get a flavor for what a thin place is, a thin experience is. The first one that comes to my mind is the birth of my kids. 
and that delivery room became very thin as I watched my kids emerge into this world. And I know it became thin because both times, I got two of them, both times, I didn't plan to think what I thought. I didn't, I didn't prepare for it. But this default response in me both times that when I watch those little ones emerge into the world from their mama, the very first thought I had was, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because that room got very thin. And I saw that. And as deeply moved as I was, I just thought, this is God. There's no other explanation but God. Another time that was very thin for me was being with a couple who lost their child. What made it so thin was in the midst of that suffering and turmoil, I was witnessing their indomitable faith and trust and their uninterrupted hope. And it got really thin for me as I thought, but God... There's no explanation for this but God. It happens when I'm up here preaching on Sunday mornings sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. I always know it's a God thing, but sometimes this room gets really thin for me. And it's those times, I think I've mentioned to you before, but it's worth again. It's those times when all of a sudden I'm in front of you and I'm preaching and I'm beginning to say things that I didn't plan to say, that are not in my manuscript, that I didn't think about, that I didn't study, and all of a sudden it comes out of nowhere, and it's like I'm being carried along, and I'm just saying these things, and as I'm saying them, I'm literally thinking in my mind, oh, this is good preaching. <laughs> this is such good preaching, and I'm being preached to, and it's so good because I know it's not me. And the room gets really thin. I just feel like heaven and earth goes like this at those moments. And I know it's so because it might sound surprising, but what I feel when I'm finished preaching after an occurrence like that is scared to death. I feel real fear inside me after that. And that's all I have to say about that. You can analyze that. All I know is sometimes I want to run away. Let me tell you about the clearest, one more, the clearest time that I felt was just so, so thin. I had gone on a prayer retreat by myself in the mountains of North Carolina in the middle of nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. Some friends arranged a cabin for me there that I could hardly find in the side of a mountain covered with trees. You know, those are the places where there is no cell service and no GPS, so you're just praying that God shows you this place and the key fits. <laughs> and I found it and had a glorious week with God, just his word and me and my journal. But on Sunday, I wanted to go find a church and worship. And so I got in my car and just drove around, because again, no cell service, saying, Lord, show me a place that I can be with your people and worship. And I came upon this little church, again, right in the side of this beautiful mountain. And I walked in, and it smelled like mothballs. <laughs> and there were maybe 10, 12 people there, mountain folk, hill folk. And I walked in and thought, oh, what have I walked into? And they welcomed me like I was a long-lost relative. And I had three or four invites to lunch right when I walked in. And when the service was about to begin, I watched a guy stand up who I don't think had, didn't even know what a razor was. <laughs> and he went up and grabbed a bass guitar that looked really old. And he plugged it into an amp that equally looked old. This amp literally had twine little rope wrapped around it, and you knew it was just holding it together. And then a really large woman stood up and, and went to an upright piano and began to play a little, and that thing hadn't been tuned in decades. 
and everybody stood up and they began to play together, if you'd call it together. It wasn't together. It was so messy. And they began to sing and the place got really thin. Because I was in the presence of the sacred and holy and they were worshiping the God they loved. And it was so thin. And then the pastor stood up. I'll put it crudely, but hear the whole thing I have to say. The man couldn't have preached his way out of a wet sack. And I'm listening to this sermon, and all of a sudden the room got really thin again as his love for God oozed. His love for his word just radiated, and his love for the sheep oh, was just so apparent. And I would tell you to this day, it's the greatest sermon I've ever heard. But I would argue, again, I would argue that that night in Bethlehem was the thinnest of all places in any experience for all of the history of the world. I'll bet that night in Bethlehem was tissue paper thin as literally heaven came down in the form of a newborn baby boy. All of that is in that word, appeared. He appeared. And we all have to decide if he was real or a myth. And then we all have to decide if he was indeed real, was he who he said he was, who others said he was, was his teaching divine, was his death efficacious, was his ransom paid, his redemptive work on the cross, was he really resurrected from the dead? We have to decide all of that. In that word appeared, the Son of God appeared. And John says, please believe it. I saw all this, I heard all this, I felt this, and I want you to believe it with me. And maybe this Advent season 2022 is a time where even now you hear God calling you, perhaps for the first time, to believe it. To believe it. But John says that he appeared and Here's the reason I want to say, John says, because I know there's other reasons to save sinners. And Jesus said, I've come to seek and save that which is lost. And, and Jesus said in Mark 10 that I've come to be a ransom for many. But John says, my answer in this text right here is that he appeared to destroy the works of the devil. <laughs> so you, in, your, in your mind's eye, I do a million times throughout Advent, in your mind's eye, just try to see what that manger scene looked like. And you look at it and you think, hmm, he's there because he came to destroy the works of the devil. He's on a destructive mission. So I want to point out three things from John's word. Number one, there is a devil. John just assumes you believe that, that there is a devil. And he is real. And increasingly, fewer quote-unquote Christians are believing that there is a devil and that he's real. And they're abandoning the historical orthodox teaching of Holy Scriptures literally from cover to cover, literally from the beginning to the end. I'm telling you, from the beginning to the end, they're ignoring the reality of the enemy of God and their own enemy by not believing that such a person, such a being exists. And I would say real quick as a side note, I happen to think them abandoning that belief is an evidence of his reality. But John says he came, Jesus appeared to destroy the works of the devil. The devil, 
Listen, I don't need to convince you. I think all of us would acknowledge, no matter what background you come from or whatever faith or beliefs that you have, that we live in a world that is filled with evil. All you have to do is look around and you see the evil, the evil of war, the evil of division and destruction, the evil of pandemics, the evil of the destruction of relationships, the evil of the breakdown of families and homes, the evil of virtually any sin that you can imagine. The evil is all around us, but we need to be careful as Christians. We're good at this in the American church. We need to be careful from sitting in this building and saying, yeah, there's evil, there's evil, there's evil, because not only is there evidence of evil all around us, we need only to take a little bit of time and look inside and see evil. And see evil. By doing and saying and thinking those things that we know don't conform to the character and the will of God, those things that break his law, and there seems to be always a few, one or two or three, a few for each one of us that we just keep doing and keep doing. And sooner or later, we need to look within ourselves and recognize this, just pause for some gut check, self-evaluation. Sooner or later, we need to every now and then look into ourselves and say, something is really wrong with me, really wrong. I had lunch with a guy many years ago. We were talking about these kind of things, and he looked over and he goes, Tony, when he gets right down to it, we're all nuts, aren't we? And I said, well, I think we are nuts, Bob. So you just kind of get down to that. You're right. I've been seriously wrong. I did something a, a week or so ago that I felt was so out of character, I couldn't believe it. And I said something that I correct in people all the time. When it was all over, I said to myself, that's just not me. What are you doing, Tony? And when somebody tells me about something and they say, and that's not me, I always say, well, then who was it? Yeah. The problem is, you're seeing what's in you that you never knew was in you. Well, we acknowledge that there's evil around us, and we take a little bit of time to pause and look within ourselves, we see the evil within us, but then we stop and don't go forward and realize that there is a being behind the power of all evil in the world and within ourselves. There is a being that's in charge of that evil. There is a being from whence that evil and power came from. John says in our text, the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And here we're reminded during Advent 2022 in what I would say is a Christmas text of Scripture that he appeared to destroy the works of the devil by being reminded that there is a devil. And there is. And he's smart. And he's cunning. And the Apostle Paul used the word schemes, which means he has well thought out plans for this world and for your life and your marriage and your kids. So we need to remember as we read these words that there is a devil. Jesus came to destroy his works. That's the second thing. Not only is there a devil, but he's working. That word coming from a Greek word, ergon, E-R-G-O-N, ergon, and it means to be occupied consistently in an employment or an endeavor where you are seeking to achieve a, a desired ends. It's kind of a wordy way of saying you're doing something all the time to try to accomplish something is what this word ergon means. And what John is reminding us that we know is that the devil is occupying himself 24-7, 365, not just himself, but with a vast army of legions upon legions of fallen angels called demons that are out and about all over the world doing his bidding, carrying out this occupation and plan that he has towards his desired ends. The question is, what work is he doing? Well, in our text, and I won't read it, you can reread it later, John uses the word sin. He says sin comes from the devil because he has been sinning from the beginning and he never stops sinning. 
And I, several weeks ago, you can go back and listen. I'm not going to spend too much time talk to you about sin. And, and I told you that ultimately, in a fundamental sense, that what sin really is, is our desire to dethrone God and enthrone ourselves. Encourage me. Does anybody remember that? Give me a yeah, yeah. Right on. That's what's going on. And we know that's where Lucifer began. He wanted the throne. And God said, you're out of here. And all of those angels followed that became demons. And since that moment, starting in the Garden of Eden, what the devil has done, this work, this ergon, this occupation he has, is to get human beings to live a life endeavoring and working towards dethroning God and enthroning themselves by breaking his law and declaring to God, I'm in charge of me. I'll sit on the throne of me, not you. That's the work that he's after. He wants to separate man from God. He wants man to rebel against God. He hates God, and he wants us to hate God. Don't we see that clearly in the life of Job? Remember the very beginning, Satan goes to God to talk about Job. Scratch that. Let me correct that. It wasn't right. Satan goes to God to have a conversation, and God brings up Job to Satan. I don't like that passage of Scripture. I never want God to say, you ever think about Tony? Don't do that. I don't want you to do that. But he said, if you considered my servant Job, and you know what Satan says to him? I'll paraphrase. Let me add him, and he will curse you to your face. That's what he wants. That's his work. It didn't work. So he and God talked again. He said, let me add him deeper and in different ways, and I'll tell you what, I'll get him to curse you to your face. That's what he wants. There is a devil, and he's working, and Jesus came to destroy those works. I just love that word destroy. Not so much the English one as the Greek word, luo, L-U-O. It has all these different flavors of meaning that really mean the same thing. So I just typed out a bunch of phrases from some different Greek lexicons. Let me give them to you. Luo. To loose and untie that which is bound together, to set free and discharge, to dissolve and dismiss, to unbind any force or bond, to subvert, to take away all authority, to break, destroy, demolish, to take a coherent, consistent system and pattern and render it chaotic and unable to perform. It means to overthrow and to defeat. Isn't that a cool word? And what, what we're reading, what we're learning, when it says that the reason for the first Christmas was because God knows the coherent, organized, wise, in his terms, system that Satan has. And so he sent his one and only son to the earth to undo all that and make it chaotic and destroy it and render it ineffectual and impotent to the people of God. That's Christmas. You want to say something like that and say, so Merry Christmas, church. That's what he came to do. That was the reason that he came was to take this power of Satan over his people and destroy it, utterly undo it. So we read these powerful words from Colossians 2 that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Or listen to this Christmas text in Hebrews 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood... He himself likewise partook of the same things of flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. <laughs> Couldn't you just hear hell screaming on that first 
Christmas night. And there's some plans for Satan that God has still. And we read them out them at the end of the book in Revelation 20, where first it says this. This is the first thing that's going to happen. And he, meaning Jesus, sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit. And he shut it and he sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. And you say, what happens after that little while? We read on in Revelation 20, and then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will there be tormented, tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> That's why he came. That's why he came. That's why he appeared. Why did he appear? Why did he come? Because he came to destroy Satan's power and the works of Satan that he has over his people, totally unchain his people from the power and penalty of sin and the power and penalty and works of Satan, and to one day cast him into the eternal pit of, of unquenchable fire where he'll be tormented day and night. That's the Christmas message. That's the Christmas message. So let me round the corner and start heading towards home. Hey, I might be done early. That deserves some cookies. <laughs> Let me round the corner here and head home. And I, I, I thought this, you know, we got all these different reasons in the Bible that tells us why he came. All these different beautiful, powerful, awesome answers that explains Christmas. I think we need to step back and look at the lot of them and give one general answer for all of them. So it almost is like this. Travis told us that he came to save sinners. Why? And Jonathan said he came to be a ransom for many. Well, why? He came to destroy the works of the devil. Why? Answer? Because he loves you. There's your big general answer and reason for Christmas. Because he loves you. This is amazing. This is amazing. That's why the Father sent him for this reason. For God so loved the world that he gave. He sent. And Jesus said, why is in this world? I love you. I love you. Greater love has no one than someone lays down his life for his friends. And you're my friends. I love you. Why Christmas? Why? all these answers. Ultimately, because God is love, and I'm loved the way I am right now. I think the challenge of Advent, check that, I think the call of Advent is not so much to see if you believe that he came to save sinners or give his life as a ransom, to see if you believe that he, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Those are important. You've got to deal with that. I think the call of Advent is, will you believe he loves you? Even in light of what you did last night, that he loves you. I want you to see something that Brennan Manning wrote as only Brennan Manley, ba Manning could write it. Brennan Manning says, you could more easily catch a hurricane in a shrimp net than you can understand the wild, relentless, passionate, uncompromising, pursuing love of God made present in the manger. Hear God saying, I know your whole life story. I know every skeleton in your closet. I know every moment of sin, shame, dishonesty, and degraded love that has darkened your past. Right now, I know your shallow faith, your feeble prayer life, and your inconsistent discipleship. And my word is this, I dare you to trust that I love you just as you are and not as you should be because you're never going to be as you should be. 
That's a good word for us for Advent. To hear him say, I dare you to trust that I love you. And I'll give you this promise. If you'll just lay down and believe that, just finally take a deep breath and say, oh, my word, I am loved. I'm the beloved of God. Listen, the cookies will taste sweeter. The lights will glisten a little brighter. The giving and receiving of gifts will be funner. The singing of these carols will be deeper. Because there's nothing like finding rest and peace in believing that you're loved just as you are and not as you should be because we're never going to be as we should be. Lord, I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would remove any impediment in anyone's life that's hearing these words right now. Remove any impediment that's in anyone's life that is keeping them from seeing your great love and receiving it and resting in it and reveling in it and finding meaning and identity and purpose. Father, would you come by the power of the Holy Spirit and knock down those strongholds? Because this devil who is real, I know would do anything and spare no expense to keep us from believing that you love us. So, Lord, do a mighty, powerful, supernatural work in my life and in my friends' lives in this room and those listening online. Do a mighty, powerful, supernatural work so that we would calm and quiet our soul like a weaned child with its mother in the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.